Eros in Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 3, The Origin of Repressive Civilization, Philogenesis. The quest for the origin of repression leads back to the origin of instinctual repression, which occurs during early childhood. The superego is the heir of the Oedipus complex and the repressive organization of sexuality is chiefly directed against its pregenital and perverse manifestations. Moreover, the trauma of birth releases the first expressions of the death instinct, the impulse to return to the nirvana of the womb, and necessitates the subsequent controls of this impulse. It is in the child that the reality principle completes its work with such thoroughness and severity that the mature individual's behavior is hardly more than a repetitive pattern of childhood experiences and reactions. But the childhood experiences which become traumatic under the impact of reality are pre-individual, generic, with individual variations, the protracted dependence of the human infant, the Oedipus situation, and pregenital sexuality all belong to the genus man. Moreover, the unreasonable severity of the superego, of the neurotic personality, the unconscious sense of guilt, and the unconscious need for punishment seem to be out of proportion with the actual sinful impulses of the individual. Their perpetuation, and as we shall see, intensification of the sense of guilt throughout maturity, the excessively repressive organization of sexuality, cannot be adequately explained in terms of the still acute danger of individual impulses. Nor can the individual reactions to early tra traumata be adequately explained by what the individual himself has experienced. They deviate from individual experiences in a way that would accord much better with their being reactions to genetic events, and in general they can be explained only through such an influence. The analysis of the mental structure of the personality is thus forced to, to regress behind early childhood, from the prehistory of the individual to that of the genus. In the personality, according to Otto Rank, there, there operates a biological sense of guilt, which stands for the demands of the species. The moral principles which the child imbibes from the persons responsible for its upbringing during the first years of its life reflect certain phylogenetic echoes of primitive man. Of primitive man. Civilization is still determined by its archaic heritage, and this heritage, so Freud asserts, includes not only dispositions, but also ideational contents, memory traces of the experiences of former generations. Individual psychology is thus in itself group psychology, insofar as the individual itself still is an archaic identity with the species. This archaic heritage bridges the gap between individual and mass psychology. This conception has far-reaching implications for the method and substance of social science. As psychology tears the ideological veil and traces the construction of the personality, it is led to dissolve the individual. His autonomous personality appears as the fro frozen manifestation of the general repression of mankind. Self-consciousness and reason, which have conquered and shaped the historical world, have done so in the image of repression, internal and external. They have worked as the agents of domination, the liberties which they have brought, and these are considerable, grew in the soil of enslavement and have retained the mark of their birth. These are the disturbing implications of Freud's theory of the personality. By dissolving the idea of the ego personality into its primary components, psychology now bears the sub-individual and pre-individual factors, which, largely unconscious to the ego, actually make the individual. It reveals the power of the universal in and over the individuals. This disclosure undermines one of the strongest ideological fortifications of modern culture, namely the notion of the autonomous individual. Freud's theory here joins the great critical efforts to dissolve ossified sociological concepts into their historical content. <clears throat> 
His psychology does not focus on the concrete and complete personality as it exists in its private and public environment, because this existence conceals rather than reveals the essence and nature of the personality. It is the end result of long historical processes which are congealed in the network of human and institutional entities making up society, and these processes define the personality and its relationships. Consequently, to understand them for what they really are, psychology must unfreeze them by tracing their hidden origins. In doing so, psychology discovers that the determining childhood experiences are linked with the experiences of the species, that the individual lives the universal fate of mankind. The past defines the present because mankind has not yet mastered its own history. To Freud, the universal fate is in the instinctual drives, but they are themselves subject to historical modifications. At their beginning is the experience of domination, symbolized by the primal father. The extreme Oedipus situation. It is never entirely overcome. The mature ego of the civilized personality still preserves the archaic heritage of man. If this dependency of the ego is not kept in mind, the increased emphasis in Freud's later writings on the autonomy of the mature ego might be abused as justification for abandoning the most advanced conceptions of psychoanalysis a retreat undertaken by the cultural and interpersonal schools. In one of his last papers, Freud proposes that not all modifications of the ego are acquired during the defensive conflicts of early childhood. He suggests that each individual ego is endowed from the beginning with its own peculiar dispositions and tendencies, that there exist primary congenital variations in the ego. However, this new autonomy of the ego seems to turn into its opposite. Far from retracting the notion of the ego's essential dependency on pre-individual, generic constellations, Freud strengthens the role of these constellations in the development of the ego, for he interprets the congenital variations of the ego in terms of our archaic heritage. And he thinks that even before the ego exists, its subsequent lines of development, tendencies, and reactions are already determined. Indeed, the apparent renaissance of the ego is accompanied by the accentuation of the deposits from primitive human development present in our archaic heritage. When Freud concludes from the congenital structure of the ego that the topographical differentiation between ego and id loses much of its value for our investigation, then this assimilation of ego and id seems to alter the balance between the two mental forces in favor of the id rather than the ego, the generic rather than the individual processes. No part of Freud's theory has been more strongly rejected than the idea of the survival of the archaic heritage. His reconstruction of the prehistory of mankind from the primal horde through patricide to civilization. The difficulties in scientific verification and even in logical consistency are obvious and perhaps insurmountable. Moreover, they are reinforced by the taboos which the Freudian hypothesis so effectively violates. It does not lead back to the image of a paradise which man has forfeited by his sin against God, but to the domination of man by man, established by a very earthly father despot and perpetuated by the unsuccessful or uncompleted rebellion against him. The origin sin was against man, and it was no sin because it was committed against one who was himself guilty. And this phylogenetic hypothesis reveals that mature civilization is still conditioned by archaic mental immaturity. The memory of prehistoric impulses and deeds continues to haunt civilization. The repressed material returns, and the individual is still punished for impulses long since mastered and deeds long since undone. If Freud's hypothesis is not corroborated by any anthropological evidence, it would have to be discarded altogether except for the fact that it telescopes, in a sequence of catastrophic events, the historical dialectic of domination and thereby elucidates aspects of civilization hitherto unexplained. We use Freud's anthropological speculation only in this sense. 
for its symbolic value. The archaic events that the hypothesis stipulates may forever be beyond the realm of anthropological verification. The alleged consequences of these events are historical facts, and their interpretation in the light of Freud's hypothesis lends them a neglected significance, which points to the historical future. If the hypothesis devise, defies common sense, it claims in its defiance, a truth which common sense has been trained to forget. In Freud's construction, the first human group was established and sustained by the enforced rule of one individual over all others. At one time in the life of the genus man, life was organized by domination, and the man who succeeded in dominating the others was the father. That is to say, the man who possessed the desired women and who had with them produced and kept alive the sons and daughters. The father monopolized for himself the woman, the supreme pleasure, and subjugated the other members of the horde to his power. Did he succeed in establishing his dominion because he succeeded in excluding them from supreme pleasure? In any case, for the group as a whole, the monopolization of pleasure meant an unequal distribution of pain. The fate of the sons was a hard one. If they excited the father's jealousy, they were killed or castrated or driven out. They were forced to live in small communities and to provide themselves with wives by stealing them from others. The burden of whatever work had to be done in the primal horde would have been placed on the sons who, by their exclusion from the pleasure reserved for the father, had now become free for the channeling of instinctual energy into unpleasurable but necessary activities. The constraint on the gratification of instinctual needs imposed by the father, the suppression of pleasure, thus not only was the result of domination, but also created the mental preconditions for the continued functioning of domination. In this organization of the primal horde, rationality and irrationality, biological and sociological factors, the common and the particular interests are inextricably intertwined. The primal horde is a temporarily functioning group which sustains itself in some sort of disorder or some sort of order. It may therefore be assumed that the patriarchal despotism which established this order was rational to the extent to which it created and preserved the group. Thereby, the reproduction of the whole and the common interest and the common interest, period. Setting the model for the subsequent development of civilization, the primal father prepared the ground for progress through enforced constraint on pleasure and enforced abstinence. He thus created the first preconditions for the disciplined labor force of the future. Moreover, this hierarchical division of pleasure was justified by protection, security, and even love. Because the despot was the father, the hatred with which his subjects regarded him must from the beginning have been accompanied by a biological affection. Ambivalent emotions, which were expressed in the wish to replace and to imitate the father, to identify oneself with him, with his pleasure as well as with his power. The father establishes domination in his own interest, but in doing so, he is justified by his age, by his biological function, and most of all, by his success. <coughs> He creates that order without which the group would immediately dissolve. In this role, the primal father foreshadows the subsequent domineering father images under which civilization progressed. In his person and function, he incorporates the inner logic and necessity of the reality principle itself. He has historical rights. The productive order of the horde survived the primal father. One or the other son might, might succeed in attaining a situation similar to that of the father in the original horde. One favored position came about in a natural way. It was that of the youngest son, who protected, who, protected by his mother's love, could profit by his father's advancing years and replace him after his death. Primal patriarchal despotism thus became an effective disorder or an effective order. But the effectiveness of the superimposed organization of the horde must have been very precarious and consequently the hatred against patriarchal suppression very strong. In Freud's construction, this hatred culminates in the rebellion of the exiled sons, the collective killing and devouring of the father 
and the establishment of the brother clan, which in turn deifies the assassinated father and introduces those taboos and restraints which, according to Freud, generate social morality. Freud's hypothetical history of the primal horde treats the rebellion of the brothers as a rebellion against the father's taboo on the women of the horde. No social protest against the unequal division of pleasure is involved. Consequently, in a strict sense, civilization begins only in the brother clan, when the taboos, now self-imposed by the ruling brothers, implement repression in the common interest of preserving the group as a whole. And the decisive psychological event which separates the brother clan from the primal horde is the development of guilt feeling. Progress beyond the primal horde, i.e. civilization, presupposes guilt feeling. It interjects into the individuals and thus sustains the principal prohibitions, constraints, and delays in gratification on which civilization depends. It is a reasonable surmise that after the killing of the father, a time followed when the brothers quarreled among themselves for the succession, which each of them wanted to obtain for himself alone. They came to see that these fights were as dangerous as they were futile. This hard-won understanding, as well as the memory of the deed of liberation they had achieved together, and the attachment that had grown up among them during the time of their ex exile, led at last to a union among them, a sort of social contract. Thus, there came into being the first form of a social organization accompanied by a renunciation of instinctual gratification. Recognition of mutual obligations, institutions declared sacred, which could not be broken, in short, the beginnings of morality and law. The rebellion against the father is rebellion against biologically justified authority. His assassination destroys the order which has preserved the life of the group. The rebels have committed a crime against the whole and thereby also against themselves. They are guilty before the others and before themselves, and they must repent. The assassination of the father is the supreme crime because the father established the order of reproductive sexuality and thus is, in his person, the genus which creates and preserves all individuals. The patriarch, father and tyrant in one, unites sex and order, pleasure and reality. He evokes love and hatred. He guarantees the biological and sociological basis on which the history of mankind depends. The annihilation of his person threatens to annihilate lasting group life itself and to restore the prehistoric and subhistoric destructive force of the pleasure principle. But the sons want the same thing as the father. They want lasting satis satisfaction of their needs. They can attain this objective only by repeating in a new form the order of domination which had controlled pleasure and the thereby preserved the group. The father survives as the god in whose adoration the sinners repent so that they can continue to sin, while the new fathers secure those suppressions of pleasure which are necessary for preserving their rule and their organization of the group. The progress from domination by one to domination by several involves a social spread of pleasure and makes repression self-imposed in the ruling group itself. All its members have to obey the taboos if they want to maintain their rule. Repression now permeates the life of the oppressors themselves, and part of their instinctual energy becomes available for sublimation in work. At the same time, the taboo on the women of the clan leads to expansion and amalgamation with other hordes. Organized sexuality begins that formation at larger units, or of larger units, which Freud regarded as the function of eros in civilization. The role of the women gains increasing importance. A good part of the power which had become vacant through the father's death passed to the women. The time of the matriarchate followed. It seems essential for Freud's hypothesis that in the sequence of the development towards civilization, the matriarchal period is preceded by primal patriarchal despotism. The low degree of repressive domination, the extent of erotic freedom which are traditionally associated with matriarchy appear in Freud's hypothesis as consequences of the overthrow of patriarchal despotism rather than as primary natural conditions. In the development of civilization, freedom becomes possible only as liberation.
liberty follows domination and leads to the reaffirmation of domination. Matriarchy is replaced by a patriarchal counter-revolution, and the latter is stabilized by the institutionalization of religion. During that time, a great social revolution had taken place. Matriarchy was followed by a restitution of the patriarchal order. order. The new fathers, it is true, never succeeded to the omnipotence of the primeval father. There were too many of them, and they lived in larger communities than the original horde had been. They had to get on with one another and were restricted by social institutions. Male gods at first appear as sons by the side of the great mother deities, but gradually they assume the, figure, the features of the father. Polytheism cedes to monotheism and then returns the one and only father deity whose power is unlimited. Sublime and sublimated original domination becomes eternal, cosmic and good, and in this form guards the process of civilization. The historical rights of the primal father are restored. The sense of guilt, which in Freud's hypothesis is intrinsic to the brother clan and its subsequent consolidation into the first society is primarily guilty feeling or guilt feeling about the per perpetration of the supreme crime, patricide. Anxiety arises over the consequences of the crime. However, these consequences are twofold. They threaten to destroy the life of the group by the removal of the authority which, although in terror, had preserved the group. And at the same time, this removal promises a society without the father, that is, without suppression and domination. Must it not be assumed that the sense of guilt reflects this twofold structure and its ambival ambivalence? The rebellious parasites act only to forestall the first consequence, the threat. They re-establish domination by substituting many fathers for one, and then by deifying and internalizing the one father. But in doing so, they betray the promise of their own deed, the promise of liberty. The despot patriarch has succeeded in implanting his reality principle in the rebellious sons. The revolt has, for a short span of time, broken the chain of domination, then the new freedom is again suppressed, this time by their own authority and action. Must not their sense of guilt include guilt about the betrayal and denial of their deed? Are they not guilty of restoring the repressive father, guilty of self-imposed perpetuation of domination? The question suggests itself if Freud's phylogenetic hypothesis is confronted with his notion of the instinctual dynamic. As the reality principle takes root, even, if it, even in its most primitive and most brutally enforced form, the pleasure principle becomes something frightful and terrifying. The impulses for free gratification meet with anxiety, and this, in, and this anxiety calls for protection against them. The individuals have to defend themselves against the specter of their integral liberation from want and pain, against integral gratification. And the latter is represented by the woman who, as mother, has once, for the first time and last time, provided such gratification. These are the instinctual factors which reproduce the rhythm of liberation and domination. Through her sexual power, a woman is dangerous to the community, the social structure of which rests on the fear displaced to the father. The king is slain by the people, not in order that they may be free, but that they may, be, they may take upon themselves a heavier yoke one that will protect them more surely from the mother. The king father is slain not only because he imposes intolerable restraints, but also because the restraints imposed by an individual person are not effective enough a barrier to incest, not effective enough to cope with the desire to return to the mother. Liberation is therefore followed by even better domination. The development of the paternal domination into an increasingly powerful state system administered by man is thus a continuance of the primal repression, which as its purpose, which has as its purpose the ever wider exclusion of woman. The overthrow of the king father is crime, but so is his restoration, and both are necessary for the progress of civilization. The crime against the reality principle is redeemed by the crime against the pleasure principle. Redemption thus cancels itself. The sense of guilt is sustained in spite of repeated and intensified redemption. 
anxiety persists because the crime against the pleasure principle is not redeemed. There is guilt over a deed that has not been accomplished, liberation. Some of Freud's formulations seem to indicate this. The sense of guilt was the consequence of, of uncommitted aggression, and it is not really a decisive matter whether one has killed one's father or abstained from the deed. One must feel guilty in either case, for guilt is the expression of the conflict of ambivalence, the eternal struggle between eros and the destructive or death instinct. Much earlier, Freud spoke of a pre-existing sense of guilt, which seems to be lurking in the individual ready and waiting to assimilate an accusation made against him. This notion seems to correspond to the idea of a floating anxiety, which has subterranean roots even beneath the individual unconscious. Freud assumes that the primal crime and the sense of guilt attached to it are reproduced in modified forms throughout history. The crime is reenacted in the conflict of the old and new generation, in revolt and rebellion against established authority, and in subsequent repentance, in the restoration and glorification of authority. In explaining this strange perpetual recurrence, Freud suggested the hypothesis of the return of the repressed, which he illustrated by the psychology of religion. Freud thought that he had found traces of the patricide and of its return and redemption in the history of Judaism, which begins with the killing of Moses. The concrete implications of Freud's hypothesis become clearer in his interpretation of anti-Semitism. He believed that anti-Semitism had deep roots in the unconscious. Jealousy over the Jewish claim of being the firstborn, favorite child of God the Father. Dread of circumcision associated with the threat of castration. And perhaps most important, grudge against the new religion, Christianity, which was forced on many modern peoples only in relatively recent times. This grudge was projected onto the source from which Christianity came, namely Judaism. If we follow this train of thought beyond Freud and connect it with the twofold origin of the sense of guilt, the life and death of Christ would appear as a struggle against the Father and as a triumph over the Father. The message of the Son was the message of liberation, the overthrow of the law, which is domination, by a gape, which is eros. This would fit in with the heretical image of Jesus as the Redeemer in the flesh, the Messiah who came to save he man here on earth. Then the subsequent transubstantiation of the Messiah, the deification of the Son beside the Father, would be a betrayal of his message by his own disciples, the denial of the liberation in the flesh, the revenge on the Redeemer. Christianity would then have surrendered the gospel of Agape Eros again, again to the law. The Father rule would be restored and strengthened. In Freudian terms, the primal crime could have been exp expiated according to the message of the Son in an order of peace and love on earth. It was not, it was not, it was rather superseded by another crime, that against the Son. With his transubstantiation, his gospel too was transubstantiated. His deification removed his message from this world suffering and repression were perpetuated. This interpretation would lend added significance to Freud's statement that the Christian peoples are badly christened, that under the thin veneer of Christianity they have remained what their ancestors were, barbarically polytheistic. They are badly christened insofar as they accept and obey the liberating gospel only in a highly sublimated form, which leaves the reality unfree as it was before. Repression, in the technical Freudian sense, played only a minor role in the institutionalization of Christianity. The transformation of the original content, the deflection from the original objective, took place in broad daylight, consciously with public argumentation and justification. Equally open was the armed struggle of institutionalized Christianity against the heretics, who tried or allegedly tried to rescue the unsublimated content and the unsublimated objective. There were good rational motives behind the bloody wars against the Christian revolutions, which filled the Christian era.
However, the cruel and organized slaughter of Cathari, Albigensians, Anabaptists, of slaves, peasants, and paupers who revolted under the sign of the cross, the burning of witches and their defenders. This sadistic extermination of the weak suggests that unconscious instinct instinctual forces broke through all the rationality and rationalization. The executioners and their bands fought the specter of a liberation which they desired, but which they were compelled to reject. The crime against the sun must be forgotten in the killing of those whose practice recalls the crime. It took centuries of progress and domestication before the return of the repressed was mastered by the power and progress of industrial civilization. But at its late stage, its rationality seems to explode in another return of the repressed. The image of liberation, which has become increasingly realistic, is persecuted the world over. Concentration and labor camps, the trials and tribulations of nonconformists, release a hatred and fury which indicate the total mobilization against the return of the repressed. If the development of religion contains the basic ambivalence, the image of domination and the image of liberation, then Freud's thesis in the future of an illusion must be reevaluated. Freud there stressed the role of religion in the historical deflection of energy from the real improvement of the human condition to an imaginary world of eternal salvation. He thought that the disappearance of this illusion would greatly accelerate the material and intellectual progress of mankind, and he praised science and scientific reason as the great liberating antagonists of religion. Perhaps no other writing shows Freud closer to the great tradition of enlightenment, but also no other shows him more clearly succumbing to the dialectic of enlightenment. In the present period of civilization, the progressive ideas of rationalism can be recaptured only when they are reformulated. The function of science and of religion has changed, as has their interrelation. Within the total mobilization of man and nature, which marks the period, science is one of the most destructive instruments, destructive of that freedom from fear which it, it once promised. As this promise evaporated into utopia, scientific becomes almost identical with denouncing the notion of an earthly paradise. The scientific attitude has long since ceased to be the militant antagonist of religion, which has equally effectively discarded its explosive elements and often accustomed man to a good conscience in the face of suffering and guilt. In the household of culture, the functions of science and religion tend to become complementary. Through their present usage, they both deny the hopes which they once aroused and teach men to appreciate the facts in a world of alienation. In this sense, religion is no, no longer an illusion, and its academic promotion falls in line with the predominant positivistic trend. Where religion still preserves the uncompromised aspirations for peace and happiness, its illusions still have a higher truth value than science, which works for their elimination. The repressed and transfigured content of religion cannot be liberated by surrendering it to the scientific attitude. Freud applies the notion of the return of the repressed, which was elaborated in the analysis of the history of individual neuroses, to the general history of mankind. This step from individual to group psychology introduces one of the most controversial problems. How can the historical return of the repressed be understood? In the course of thousands of centuries, it certainly became forgotten that there was a primeval father, and what fate he met. In what sense, therefore, can there be any question of a tradition? Freud's answer, which assumes an impression of the past in unconscious memory traces, has encountered widespread rejection. However, the assumption loses much of its fantastic character if it is confronted with the concrete and tangible factors which refresh the memory of every, of every generation. In enumerating the conditions under which the repressed material may penetrate into consciousness, Freud mentions a strengthening of the instincts attached to the repressed material and events and experiences which are so much like the repressed material that they have the power to awaken it. As an example for the strengthening of the instincts, he cites the processes during puberty. Under the impact of the ripening genital sexuality, there reappear 
in the fantasies of all persons the infantile tendencies, and among them one finds in regular frequency and, in the first place, the sexual feeling of the child for the parents. Usually, this has already been differentiated by sexual attraction, namely the attraction of the son for the mother and of the daughter for the father. Simultaneously with the overcoming and rejection of these distinctly incestuous fantasies, there occurs one of the most important as well as one of the most painful psycho psychic accomplishments of puberty. It is the breaking away from the parental authority, through which alone is formed that opposition between the new and old generation, which is so important for cultural progress. The events and experiences which may awaken the repressed material, even without a specific strengthening of the instincts attached to it, to it are at the societal level encountered in the institutions and ideologies which the individual faces daily and which reproduce in their very structure both domination and the impulse to overthrow it. Family, school, workshop, and, and office, the state, the law, the prevailing philosophy and morality. The decisive difference between the primal situation and its civilized historical return is, of course, that in the latter, the ruler father is normally no longer killed and eaten, and that domination is normally no longer personal. The ego, the superego, and the external reality have done their work, but it is not really a decisive matter whether one has killed one's father or abstained from the deed, if the function of the conflict and its consequences are the same. In the Oedipus situation, the primal situation recurs under circumstances which from the beginning assure the lasting triumph of the father. But they also assure the life of the son and his future ability to take the father's place. How did civilization achieve this compromise? The multitude of somatic, mental, and social processes which resulted in this achievement are practically identical with the contents of Freud's psychology. Force, identification, repression, sublimation cooperate in the formation of the ego and superego. The function of the father is gradually transferred from his individual person to his social position, to his image in the son, conscience, to God, to the various agencies and agents which teach the son to become a mature and restrained member of his society. Ceteris paribus, the intensity of restraint and renunciation involved in this process is probably not smaller than it was in the primal horde. However, they are more rationally distributed between father and son and among society as a whole, and the rewards, though not greater, are relatively secure. The monogamic family, with its enforceable obligations for the father, restricts his monopoly of pleasure, the institution of inheritable private property, and the universalization of labor give the son a justified expectancy of his own sanctioned pleasure in accordance with his socially useful performances. Within this framework of objective law and institution, the processes of puberty lead to the liberation from the father as a necessary and legitimate event. It is nothing short of a mental catastrophe, but it is nothing more. Then the son leaves the patriarchal family and sets out to become a father and boss himself. The transformation of the pleasure principle into the performance principle, which changes the despotic monopoly of the father into restrained educational and economic authority, also changes the original object of the struggle, the mother. In the primal horde, the image of the desired woman, the mistress wife of the father, was Eros and Thanatos in immediate natural union. She was the aim of the sex instincts, and she was the mother in whom the son once had that integral peace, which is the absence of all need and desire, the nirvana before birth. Perhaps the taboo on incest was the first great protection against the death instinct, the taboo on nirvana, on the regressive impulse for peace, which stood in the way of progress, of life itself. Mother and wife were separated, and the fatal identity of Eros and Thanatos was thus dissolved. With regard to the mother, sensual love becomes aim inhibited and transformed into affection, tenderness. Sexuality and affection are divorced, only later they are to meet again in the love to the wife which is sensual as well as tender, aim inhibited as well as aim attaining. Tenderness is created out of abstinence, 
abstinence first enforced by the primal father. Once created, it becomes the psychical basis not only for the family, but also for the establishment of lasting group relations. The primal father had prevented his sons from satisfying their directly sexual tendencies. He forced them into abstinence and consequently into the emotional ties with him and with one another, which could arise out of those of their tendencies that were inhibited in their sexual aim. He forced them, so to speak, into group psychology. At this level of civilization, within the system of rewarded inhibitions, the father can be overcome without exploding the instinctual and social order. His image and his function now perpetuate themselves in every child, even if it does not know him. He merges with duly constituted authority. Domination has outgrown the sphere of personal relationships and created the institutions for the orderly satisfaction of human needs on an expanding scale. But it is precisely the development of these institutions which undermines the established basis of civilization. Its inner limits appear in the late industrial age.